Come on, let's give Jesus a big hand clap one more time. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Come on, he's worthy. Come on, he's worthy. Hallelujah. Well, what an honor to be back in Bellevue, Florida, Souls Harbor, with Bishop Varnum and Mrs. Bishop Varnum. I told the fellas today, she's preached the longest running revival in the history of the Pentecostal movement. They said she met Bishop in a revival. Well, she met him. Then he had her come preach a revival for three weeks and proposed to her, and they're still in revival. Still having revival. My Lord. God bless Bishop and his wife and Pastor Varnum and his family and those three yahoos that picked me up today, Madison and Luke and... Andrew, Brother Bishop Varnum, your car has a lot of get up and go. It's got a good punch to it. It's got a good punch to it. I asked Madison, is this your vehicle? Where is he at? He, there he is right there. He said, no, no, I wish this was my vehicle. I said, well, what kind of vehicle do you have? <laughs> uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. What a wonderful day we had. I appreciate them picking me up. That had been a long walk from the airport. And uh, what an honor to be here. I was here in 04. I don't remember preaching every service. I don't, uh, amen. I must have been younger then. What an honor, Sister Danae Varnum. Uh, I was here before that with a music group uh, back before anybody knew I was a preacher. Uh, so it's an honor to be here tonight. And uh, I feel a word from the Lord for this conference tonight. And uh, I want to have the Lord have his way. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Lord, have your way. When Jesus showed up at the temple at his birth, there were prayer warriors in that temple. Simeon and Anna were present. Prayer warriors. They wouldn't leave. Simeon said, now I can depart. Anna gave her song of praise. Twelve years later, Jesus is back in that same temple teaching, and they're astounded at his words. When he's 30, he said, it's become a den of thieves. And when he's 33, he says, your house is left unto you desolate. In one generation, the temple was lost. We are here to touch the gener next generation, the future. Uh, I believe what God has given us is precious, but we're just one generation from losing it. I want to pass it on intact, just like I got it. Praise God. I appreciate Brother Cade, the words he said tonight. I appreciate what we've already heard. Amen. Well, let's give the Lord one more hand clap of praise. He's worthy. Praise God. I've been pastoring a wonderful church for a number of 28 years. Been married to a wonderful lady about 34 years. Got 30-year-old twin daughters. I'm old enough now to know that if I jump up on top of this pulpit in the spirit, I'm going to have to be able to get down in the flesh. So I'm pacing myself. I got one good burst to get out of the atmosphere. I'm not like Brother Victor Jackson. You know, he just, man, he gets to going and just, just hammers the throttle. I remember those days. 
So if I'm calm and collected a little bit, you can go ahead and shout and worship and praise God. I'll jump in there with you in a minute. <laughs> All right. We're going to have church tonight, I can tell you that. That's what we're going to have. Praise God. Amen. I'm a little convicted because in my study of the temple, I found the, uh, the priests were to wear linen garments that so they wouldn't sweat. They had a move of God without any sweat. Wow. Wow. Brother Klein, it's so good to see you. I hope you're on your Bible app, not your eBay app. I'm teasing you. I'm, te I'm so honored, brother. This great, great people. So many people here that I'm. Let me get to the word. Judges 7, verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. And they had but newly set the watch, and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow and cried the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And they stood, every man in his place, round about the camp. And all the host, oh, well, they were running. They were running and crying and fleeing. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word tonight, God, and for this anointed atmosphere. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, you do a mighty work. I thank you for the word that's going to go forth like bread tonight. It's going to go forth, Lord, like a sword tonight. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you're going to do in the next few minutes. I thank you for the prayer that's been prayed for this conference. I thank you for the words you've given every preacher. I pray you anoint God the ears of your hearers tonight. In Jesus' name, we praise you for it. In Jesus' name. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, I'm going to help the preacher preach for a minute here. God bless you. You can be seated in the name of the Lord. In Judges chapter 7, we read a story of a man by the name of Gideon and his 300 men. I won't go into this being the highlight of Gideon's life, the high point, but this was a point in Gideon's life in victory and power. Israel was surrounded by Midianites, and the Midianites were a very formidable foe. They were descendants of the children of Abraham that had been sent into the wilderness with Ishmael. They were a marauding, nomadic people. History says that these Midianites were the first people to domesticate camels. What point would that make? It just simply means they had great mobility in the desert, and that was a considerable strategic advantage. So what would happen is they would sweep down and, and lay siege on Israel, cut supply lines, take their crops, and it just kept on happening and Israel got tired of losing their beans. Yeah, I want those beans back. God finally persuaded a reluctant leader by the name of Gideon to at least attempt a retaliation before Israel starved to death. And inspired by Gideon's leadership and probably by necessity, 32,000 men assemble themselves in defense of their great nation. The Bible says the Midianites numbered in the tens of thousands. In fact, the scripture says there were so many that Israel could not count them all. The scripture describes them as a plague of grasshoppers. They had a huge task ahead of them. They needed God to help them. Gideon's army is 32,000 men, and God says to Gideon, huh, that's too many. What, what do you mean, too, too many? God says, Gideon, 
Everybody that's afraid, send them home. 22,000 men stepped out and admitted. And I don't, these men must not have been from Florida. Huh. 22,000 men admitted in front of all their peers that they were scared. I don't know who the first fellow was that stepped out, but somebody started the avalanche. I'm afraid. I'm scared. I don't know if I would blame them for being scared. I don't know if I turn and ask Brother K tonight if he was a little scared before he preached tonight. I think there's a little healthy fear in all of us. There's some things you better fear. And I won't chase that rabbit. But I will say this. 22,000 men said the enemy is stronger than we are. And we're going to go home. We're going to sit this one out. We think the odds are too great. And there were 10,000 soldiers left. And God said, Gideon, <laughs> too many. Take them down to the river and watch how they receive the water. And if they stick their head in the water and mess around and blow bubbles and splash their neighbor, send them home. I don't need anybody that's gonna have a moment of inattention. I don't need anybody that's gonna get distracted by refreshment. I don't need anybody, uh-oh, uh I'm feeling my help coming a little bit. Everybody that picks the water up, keeps a watchful eye, knows there's a reason I'm here, knows the, the foe may be great and the odds may be great, but I believe God is with me. All my friends have forsaken and gone home. I got 22,000 scaredy cats and another 9,700 that thought this was a pool party. Twenty-two thousand said we're done. Ninety-seven hundred said I think we ought to go to the to the adventure park. <laughs> Three hundred are left. Three hundred. You know the story. And I'm not. I'm not in junior camp. I, I don't need to tell this whole story. But I hope you have not read it so much and heard it so much that you missed the point that God whittled a 32,000 man army down to a militia of 300 men. And then he did something crazy. God has a crazy streak in him. Just wild, just nutty. When you get him figured out, I'll give you my email address and you can send me all the directions. But Sister Varnum, he took a 32,000 man army and said 300 will do. And then he told Gideon, go get their weapons. I mean, I don't know about you, but, but I start thinking about these 300 men. And bear with me for a minute. I'm, uh, we're taxiing. These 300 men, these are bad dudes. These are dudes that have seen 22,000 cats leave. These are dudes that have watched 9,700 of their other friends leave, and they know what they're about to go against. I mean, these are, these are, uh, these are not, they're, they're not the musicians. I mean, I'm a musician. I love the musicians, but, you know, musicians have this kind of, thing going on you know they kind of go to the practice room and they're not out there shaking the snakes out of the bushes I'm not in a bad way I'm not talking about spiritually they're shaking snakes out of the bushes spiritually but I'm you know they just kind of you know out there dancing with the sheep like David weird stuff everybody okay yeah. Yeah, these dudes, I don't know if they got past junior high school. I don't I don't 
know what their names were. And the Lord said, take their weapons. I, I kind of imagine a stash of weapons. I mean, they had knives in their boots, brass knuckles on each hand, sword down the back of their neck. These dudes were... No Louis Vuitton bags, Brother Cade. No, uh-uh. No mercies here. These are bad dudes. I mean, they're, ho they're like hockey players. Their teeth are out. It's got blind in one eye. Nothing to live for, Andrew. Just, yeah, I'm going out in a blaze of glory, honey. That's right. 300. Like that, just crazy dudes. But the craziness of it is Gideon says, fellas, I need your weapons. <laughs> Come on, I know there's some more hidden in there. Come on, get them all out. I want them all back. <laughs> Man, they got a cache of weapons laid out there. And Gideon says, the Lord wants you to have a few unique items. And he passes out to everybody a trumpet. <laughs> Bubba gets a trumpet. <laughs> you ever been to the junior high graduation? <laughs> Heard the junior high band? <laughs> Play pomp and circumstance? Not much pomp, <laughs> but a lot of circumstance. Yeah. He's handing out trumpets to bad dudes. And then he hands them a torch. A torch. Everybody gets a torch. Okay, now everybody get a picture. A, a torch, trumpet, and a picture. And here's what you fellas do. All the swords, all the brass knuckles, all the nunchucks. <laughs> this is what happens when I read the Bible. <laughs> and, and he says, okay, guys, you're going to put the pitcher in your left hand. You're going to put the torch down in it. And then you're going to hold the trumpet in your right hand. It's going to go something like this. When we get out there, we're going to sneak up into the right spot. And when the signal is given, you're going to crush the pitcher, grab the torch, hold it up, scream the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, and then blow the trumpet. I don't know if anybody in that group said, what key we going to be in, Bishop? <laughs> What's this one in? Do I get a solo? No. He probably had to teach him how to blow the trumpet. That, that takes a unique set of lips. Why did all this happen? Well, the simple, the simple fact of the matter is God wanted a victory so amazing that nobody would be able to take the credit for it. Uh, I'm just going to preach to you. I don't know if God's impressed with you or me or any of the initials after our name, but I want to tell you something. God's got a streak in him that says nobody's going to get the glory for this. God wanted something so amazing that nobody could say, look what we did. I want to tell you, God wants to send a revival to this nation, but none of us will be able to say, look what we did. No, it'll be a God thing. And every one of us will be amazed at what God does. Oh, come on, somebody give God praise right now. God has a plan. God has a plan. Turn to your neighbor and tell them God has a plan. Fact of the matter is, we know now, God didn't have a plan for a 32,000 man army. That wouldn't work. God didn't have a plan for a 10,000 man army. 
No, his plan required, required stealth and silence. He needed a small specialized force to move quickly and quietly through the night to a very strategic position without being detected by the enemy. He wanted them to get to the right place without making a big deal about it. <laughs> no, we don't need to tell anybody we're going into the prayer room every day. No, we're just going to go to that place and not make a big deal about it. They'll know you're praying. You're not hearing me. They'll know you've been with the Lord. You don't have to tell them where you're going or when you're doing it. Uh, come on, generate younger generation. I want to tell you something. And I, I know he, you probably shouldn't model your life after him, but one thing about Samson that's intriguing is the Bible said one he killed a lion, came back, and there's bees and, and honey in that carcass, and it refreshed him. And the Bible said he walked home, and his family tasted the honey that was in his hands, but he never told anybody where he got it. We need preachers to walk to the pulpit. You don't have to tell me all the battles you're facing. Just show me the honey. Don't tell me all the lines you're killing. Just let me taste the honey. Oh, come on, somebody praise the Lord right now. Yeah. 32,000 swords clanging against 32,000 thighs, 64,000 combat boots stumbling around in the darkness. You're not going to surprise anybody. You ever had a lock in? Brainstorm from hell, that's what that is. Lock in. Who ever thought of getting a bunch of teenagers locking them in a building? That's absolutely mind-blowing that we even thought that was remotely fun. And then turn off the lights to play black light volleyball. Turn the lights back on and six or eight or ten are missing. Never five, seven, or nine. Hey, I want to tell you what, it's dangerous running around in the dark with sharp swords and brass knuckles and nunchucks. God says, I got a plan and all your weapons are not going to work and all your, all your, all your gifts, are, they're, they're not nearly as important as what God wants to do. Oh, I got this, I got that, I'm really good at this. And I'm, hey, I want to tell you, God may take that out of your hand. I can only be useful for God if I use this. I can only do it if I can have that. <laughs> you may be standing there one day getting ready to face the biggest battle of your life and God take the thing that's the most precious out of your hand. Wait a minute, that's the thing I leaned on. That's the, my go-to, God. You took my go-to. Come on, pastor, your music director, come in and say, this is my last Sunday. How are we going to have church? Well, you just might find out. Yeah. I was shocked the day it happened in my church. No, not my church. Well, you know what I mean. <laughs> Friend Sunday, brother. On a Friend Sunday. The whole community's out there. We got the choir ready. When they hit the stage, they're going to be rolling. Musicians are all there in the back tuning up. <laughs> Man, well, I just know it's getting ready to go down. Ten minutes till ten. The biggest storm that's ever come through Salem comes rolling through. And the power goes out. Boom. I said, oh God, you're messing up our perfectly planned service. 
We had videos. We were going to have our words up there. It was going to be awesome. It's going to be like Souls Harbor. Man, lights. I had an awesome sermon ready. Wow, Willie had an organ uh, solo thing. God, you're messing up a great opportunity. Oh, yeah, I'm right on you. I'm right on you. There's a lot of things we think we've got to have to, to whip the Midianites. There's a lot of stuff we got in our back pocket. Well, if I got that and I got that, I'm okay. No, I, I'm just going to keep preaching. Yeah. I just run around. I'm, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Oh, dear God. Is there acoustic guitar in the place? Does anybody know how to play it? Wasn't even an acoustic in the place. They had one, but it wasn't there. What are we going to do, Pastor? You know, Pastor, oh, I didn't have time for a three-day fast then. I said, well, we don't have microphones. We don't have any electrical equipment. Well, I'm just going to go out there, tell everybody what happened, and maybe sing a few courses and see what will happen. I walked out in front of the pulpit, no microphone. Folks, folks, the emergency lights are are on and we can see everything. And I think we're safe. The storm is passing through, but we don't know when the electric will be back on. But we're here to worship God. We're sorry. You know, I'm really saying we're sorry our well-planned service is kaput. You're not going to get to hear our choir. <laughs> And I said, you know what? We're just going to sing a few courses that maybe you know because we had, we had all the new ones because they'd have the words. <laughs> well, we didn't have any words now. So I had to go back to Amazing Grace. And <laughs> the old rugged cross made the difference. <laughs> we start singing and those old saints start worshiping. And people start praying. And I didn't even get to my message, but people from the city start coming down the aisle and asking for prayer. And I'm like, wait, wait a minute. We can't have this now. I want to tell you, God wants to do something so amazing for us. God wants to do something so incredible in us. Oh, yes, he does. I, I, I'm hurrying. God had a plan, and he said, my plan's going to work. Your plan's going to mess up. Your plan is going to be make a lot of banging, a lot of, lot of folks getting hurt. <laughs> you know, you're going to run out there with all your, all your guns a-blazing. I got a plan, and the good thing about God's plan is it works. And I'll tell you this about God. He's much less interested in scoring style points with us. We want the style points. We want the judges up on the stage to go, that was a 9.5. Woo! Awesome! He, don't, he could care less what we think about it. He, he's not worried about the roof. Somebody needs healing, just tear the roof off. Drop them down. We'll worry about the roof later. Come on, I know the funeral procession, that's pretty orderly. I know you got order to it, but I'm gonna stop the bearer and I'm gonna speak to that little girl. I don't have time for your pomp and circumstance. God wants to do something. Oh yes, he does. Oh, clap your hands under the Lord, I'm hurrying. God, Lord, help me. The idea was this. The Midianites would be asleep in their tents. They would look out of a sleeping stupor. and They wouldn't see 300 unarmed hungry men with trumpets 
and lamps. No, they would think we are surrounded by 300 armies with superior positions. And the Bible tells us at that point, the Midianites provided their own sound effects. They began to scramble for their swords and their shields that immediately produced the sound that was necessary. That was the audio portion. They, they began to run around in the dark with sharp razors, sharp weapons. And the Bible says they killed one another by the thousands they panicked all it was was 300 hungry men in those fortified positions they didn't know how it was going to work but God did a great work that night God had a purpose for it all God had a plan for every part of it. He wasn't just shooting in the dark. The operation depended on precision. It depended on a, a, a small force, stealth and silence. The trumpet was the audio portion. It was heard loud and clear. The lamp, oh, it was the visual portion. And we need the audio and the visual portion. Yes, there was design and purpose for every small detail, it seems, except for one. Except for one. The pitcher. The pitcher. The pitcher had one purpose and one purpose only. In fact, it was perfectly suited for that purpose. It was to carry the light to the right spot and at the right time, all the vessel had to do. No, nothing fancy, nothing shiny, nothing blaring, nothing seen. Maybe heard slightly, but all the vessel had to do was break. It was the only thing on the agenda for them to do. They never sang the solo. They didn't shine the light. They were not the light. It was designed to get the light to the right place. The place where they were called and ordered to and then their only purpose was to get out of the way. Get out of the way. No, you're not hearing me, but I'm gonna preach it anyway. Get out of the way. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We're not done. I feel that intercession. I feel that burden. But we're not done. I get really nervous. It's like touching a hot stove for me. When I hear terms like, oh, if they could just, we got the greatest this and the greatest that. If they could just hear me or hear them. Oh, 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 careful, careful. We're in a holy place. Your identity is not important. Who you are is not important. What weapons you may think are beneficial are not important. The important part for you, vessel, is can you, with all your gifts and all your anointing, can you get out of the way? Oh yeah, God wants to use you. He may not use you like, he think he, like you think he should. He wants to use you. Oh, lift your hands and love the Lord right now.
Lord, I'm going to preach what you gave me. You can be seated if you want. Those victorious soldiers emerged from those hills, swinging those lamps, waving that torch, blaring every once in a while, playing an occasional note on the trumpet. The Midianites ran for their lives. You heard it. They ran. They fled. The victory was total. The spoils were lavish. The night grows even to the Sunday school teachers centuries later still tell the powerful night when 300 vessels broke. You must never forget that somewhere in those hills that night lay the shattered remains of 300 broken pots that would never return from their assigned positions. That's why I'm preaching tonight this thought. Our finest hour. The earthen vessel's role in the battle, yes, was the least glamorous, but it was the most essential. I'm going to say that again. Their role was the least glamorous, but it was the most essential. Could it be said that breaking was their finest hour? Wait, I thought carrying the light was my, no, no, you got the light. You got it in you. But that's not your finest hour. Your finest hour is when you break. Uh, uh, when you shatter, when your life is in pieces. And God knows how to get you there. picture was the delivery system. It brought light down on the hill. It ushered light down to the enemy. It delivers fear. It delivers victory. I pastor the apostolics of Salem. But I wonder if many of us have read these verses. 2 Corinthians 4, 5. Remember, our message is not about us. I don't need to go any further. Paul said, hey, this is the... the the soil from which this movement was birthed. And those old timers, we're talking about touching a generation, Brother Cade. I want to tell you what your forefathers said. Don't ever forget that we are not the message. No, we're not. It's not us. We're proclaiming Jesus Christ. All we are is the messenger. All we are is the messenger. <laughs> I remind you, Brother Cain, verse 7, if you only look at us, look, if you only see us, you will miss the brightness. We carry this precious message around in the unadorned clay pots of our ordinary lives. Why? That's to prevent anyone from confusing God's power with us. Those men were afraid for the public to get it mixed up where the power was. Paul said, I don't want anybody I'm ordinary. I don't want anybody thinking this is where the power is. That's why I appreciate this, this meeting, Brother Varnum. 
Thank God for a bishop that'll say, look, I know you want to do a pastoral anniversary and celebration, but you can do this for me. Let's have a young minister's conference. Thank God that we're telling younger men, look, it's not about us. God can use all of us. I mean, look at all of us. Look at Victor Jackson. Look at Jason Varnum. Look at Calvin Jean. Look at Luke standing over there. God's not real selective. He'll use whoever says, God, I'm here. Send me. Come on, somebody praise him right now. Come on, somebody love him right now. Just the keyboard. Just the keyboard. Just the keyboard. Come on, clap your hands under the Lord. Oh. Sit down for just a minute. We're going to open the altar in a minute for anybody that wants to, to break. Verse 8, Paul says, we, we carry this message in clay pots, ordinary men, ordinary women. That's so that people won't confuse who God is with us. Wow. Verse 8, as it is, look, there's not much chance, much chance of that. Wow, how far we've come. Paul said there's not much chance of them confusing who God is and who we are. Then he goes on to describe what he means. There's not much chance of them getting confused about where the power is. He says, you know why? <laughs> you know that we're not much to look at. We're surrounded and battered by troubles, but we're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we have not been destroyed. What they did to Jesus, they do to us. Yeah. Every generation has its heroes. Every generation has their heroes. I mean, my generation, it's Michael Jordan. Man. And I'll get into the discussion with all of you about who the greatest, <laughs> Michael Jordan. He didn't need to go gather a bunch of players to win a champ. No, he just went out and did it. I mean, I think he could have got me and Victor and a couple of Arnhems and... Won a championship. <laughs> Jordan. There was a, there's a generation that knows the names of Jesse Owens, Johnny Unitas, <laughs> Bonnie and Clyde. Boy. And now there arises a generation that knows the Curry brothers and the Greek freak and... And so it was in Israel. There was a prophet who was mentioned in the same breath as Elijah. Oh, did you hear him preach? He sounds like Elijah. The Messiah is coming because the prophet said Elijah would come. Oh, if you've been out to hear him, you got to go hear him. You got. Oh, it's strange. I know he's not in the synagogue. He's out in the wilderness. He's got funny clothes and he eats weird food and he hadn't been to the spa lately. But oh, his words. And they begin to gather. They gather by the thousands and they it's rumored to the crowd, this is the one, he's the one. This is the one who's coming in the spirit and power of Elijah. This is him, this is him. And finally it reaches a fevered pitch and somebody bold enough stands up in this incredible conference that John's preaching. It says, John, we, we got one burning question. We want to know who you are. We know who we think you are. You're Elijah. That's who you are. Are you Elijah who is to come? We, we're getting together and discussing about it. Our home friendship groups have had lessons about it. Are you Elijah? And John's got a moment. John's got a moment to put his name on the map. He's got a moment now to say, 
because we know he is and was. John knew who he was. I said John knew who he was. All he had to say was, yep, I'm the dude. Not John. No, that's why Jesus said, of women, there's not anybody greater than that man right there. And one reason for his greatness is when he's got an opportunity to print his business cards and put his name in lights. Oh yeah, he's got the chance right now. Are you Elijah? If he says yes, it hits the press. But you know what he says? Oh no, I am just a voice. I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. It doesn't matter who I am. It doesn't matter if my name's in light, but make this known. I am a voice that you better prepare the way of the Lord. That's all I am. I'm just a voice. My gifts are not important. My name's not important. My abilities are not important. I must decrease. I must decrease. Come on, it's your finest hour. Come on now. Come on, young person. Come on, you've been, you've been thinking you're feeling the call from God. He's telling you now, come on, put that down. Lay that down. Come on, get that out of your pocket. Come on, go, go, go unfriend somebody. Come on, go delete an account. Come on, go break a relationship tonight. Lay down your weapons. Ramaha. This is your finest hour. Your finest hour is not when you preach at the next Touch the Future conference. Your finest hour will be in this altar when you say, I must decrease. Ramaha. Come on, there's going to be there's going to be a victory in this place. Come on. There's going to be a breakthrough in this place. Come on. Not my will, but thy will be done, oh God. I don't know what you want to do with me, but I'm not worried about it. You got this, Lord. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm trusting you, God. I'm believing you, God. Come on, preachers. Come on, pastors. Come on, elders. Move through this crowd of young men and young ladies. Come on, put your hands on them right now. There's prophets and prophetesses in this altar. Come on, there's missionaries in this altar. There's church planters in this altar. There's the ministry of helps in this altar. Come on, there's financial givers in this altar. My greatest hours when I break. Spirit of the living God, come down. Oh, come on. Come on, battles are lost when pictures won't break. Come on, battles are lost when pictures won't break. Come on, the light doesn't shine unless pictures break. This is your greatest moment. Oh! Sweep over this conference, Lord. Touch a generation tonight, oh God. Come on, that's it. Come on, the Holy Ghost is moving. Come on, young people, pray in the Spirit. Come on, I know you're not jumping and running around the church, and that's okay. Come on, but right now God's doing something. Come on, lay it down. 
Come on, lay it down, Lord. Here it is. I don't know how you're going to do it, but Lord, I'm giving it all to you, Jesus. My life doesn't matter anymore. Somebody, God's calling you, and you've been holding back. Come on, now's the moment. Breaking is your finest hour. This is not the only time you'll break. Come on. Come on. It's a lifetime of breaking. Come on. It's a lifetime of breaking. I'm going to the wheel again, God. out there no seats pray for somebody beside you come on you may not even be able to get to the altar reach over and get a hold of somebody beside you God help us oh, this is my finest hour my greatest moment in the closet with the Lord not my will, but thy will be done. Oh, 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 let it come out of your innermost being. Come on, there's a travail coming up in this place. Come on, come on, lift up your face and lift up your voice right now, God. I'm willing to be everything you want me to be, God. Come on, he wants to fill you with his power. Yes. Yes. Remind me tonight, you're where it comes from, God. You're the light. We are not that light. You are that light. Oh, we are just, we are just the clay vessel. We're just ordinary. Come on, I want you to do something right now. I want everybody to stand. Everybody in the altar. I know, I know you're on your face. It's okay. It's going to be just as spiritual when you're standing. Come on. I want you to stand. I want you to reach over right now and pray for somebody on your left and your right. All across this altar. Come on. Just get up on your feet. I know you're weeping tears. That's okay. We're going to keep weeping. We're going to keep breaking. But we're going to, we're going to get on our feet. <laughs> There's a mighty army standing in front of me tonight. <laughs> 
I pray against every curse, against every generational curse, against every bondage. I break it right now in the name that's above every name. I release the power and the anointing of your ministry and calling on young men and young ladies. Yes, I'll be what you want me to be, God. I'll go where you want me to go, oh God. I'll do anything, God. I don't care. I'll do anything, God. Oh, (laughs) come on, something's happening right now. There is a mighty anointing of the Holy Spirit right now. Come on, let it go. Come on, let it go. There's a mighty anointing. Somebody's getting past their self right now. Come on, somebody's getting beyond themselves right now. Yes, yes. Come down, anointing. Come on, Holy Ghost. Come on, Lord. Come on now, Lord. Come on now, Lord. This is the moment we've waited for. Let the light shine now. Come on, if you don't have the Holy Ghost right now, receive the Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. Come on, the Holy Ghost is being poured out. Now, hold on just a minute. We're going to sing and worship God in just a moment. We're going to pray one more prayer. We're going to pray one more prayer. But I want you to understand the significance of it right now. I believe I've got biblical proof that two times Jesus went to prayer. For two hours he prayed, let this cup pass. It was a battle with the will of God. For two hours he prayed, if it's thy will, let this cup pass. Never, if it's not, nevertheless, not thy will, but my, not, not my will, but thy will be done. After the second hour, the Bible says an angel comes. We're not privy to that conversation. We know in the book of 1 John that you don't get an answer to your prayer unless your prayer is heard. So I'm not sure what transpired with Jesus and that angel that came and strengthened him. But I know this, that that third hour wasn't like the first two hours. No, no. He went a little further. And then he began to pray, and as it were, great drops of blood. This, my friend, is now not about the will of God. This now is about my will. Brother Varnum, when you're told you don't have to, no, no, you're not hearing me. When you're told in this garden, it's now an issue of not whether you have to. It's an issue of will you. It's like the prodigal saying, that's what sin does. It destroys your will. This is why a drug addict says, I can't get victory because they have no will for victory. This is why the prodigal said, I will arise. I will go to my father and I will say, I will. 
great this is this is the final breaking it's the breaking of his will and that's a tough task it's Samson blind grinding at the mill that old backslider and judge of Israel he has a revival in the enemy's house he prays through Woo! lead me to the pillars that hold up this this temple he got in the right place no, before this, he's always leading the parade, carrying the gates off, you know, doing big stuff. Everybody, whoa, have you seen that dude, Samson? Oh, not today. He asked a lad, just get me to the pillars. I don't care who sees me. I don't have to be on the platform. Get me to the pillars. Ah, oh, Lord, give me revival. Oh, I've been stupid. I've been ignorant. Uh, that crazy woman. I should have never messed with her. I'm sorry, God. Give me my power back. I love that kind of God. He said, okay, yep, I know you've been stupid. You admitted it. You repented. Let's go. Come on. Let's do something today. And Samson, the Bible said he gave those pillars a mighty push. And the whole building came down. And those Philistines started pulling out the stones and pulling out the bodies. And when they got down to that old judge of Israel, you know what they said? Here he is, Samson. And they said this about him. He did more on the day of his death than he did in all his years of living. No, no, no. I know you want to go live your life, but I want to tell you, Victor Jackson did more on the day he died than he did in all those practices, all those mini camps, all those scholarships. He did more on the day he died. You do more on the day you die than you do in all your living. This is the greatest moment of your life. Wait, Jesus said it to his disciples. When you gather and you eat this bread and you drink this cup, do you know every time you take communion, you are celebrating something? Do you remember what you're celebrating? You're celebrating brokenness. Maybe that's why we don't like to do it. It's a celebration of brokenness. It's a broken supper. It's a thank you, Lord, for breaking for me. Now, we're going to pray one more time. But I got, I got some startling news for you. There is no way you can make the light brighter. Let that settle on you. I know it's mind-blowing. No book you can read. No podcast you can listen to. Oh, I just wish God would get bigger in me. No, no. You cannot make the light brighter. Jesus is the light. How do you make him bigger than he is? You got him or you don't. No, no. And I'm going to tell you something. Maybe this is me, and they're sure not letting me preach every service this conference. That's probably a good thing for my sake. <laughs> Because I need some rest. But anyway, I'll say this. Maybe after this, you may not let me preach tomorrow. But I'll tell you this. I do know this. I cannot make God bigger or brighter. He's as big or as bright as he's going to get. If the Holy Ghost don't do it, it ain't going to get done. If the Holy Ghost is Christ in you. The Christ in you. 
It doesn't get any better than that. If that don't get you to heaven, ain't nothing going to get you to heaven. God is as bright and as powerful. We don't worship to make him bigger. I want to tell you something. We spend an awful lot of time and energy trying to make the light brighter. Think about it now. Think about it. Think about everything you do in church that you think if we do this, God's going to get bigger in this service. Oh, 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 oh. Think about all the stuff we do to make the light brighter when we really When really, we ought to spend more time making the vessel weaker. Because the light's there. I said the light's there. And it's incredible. We need to spend a little more time saying, Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, I decrease, you increase. It's not about me. I don't care what happens, God. I want you to be Lord in my life. Come on, reach over right now and pray for your friend beside you. And don't pray for God to get bigger. I want you to pray, Lord, help this person to decrease. Decrease. Uramaha. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on. There's a victory there. Come on. There's a peace there. There's a power there. I decrease. Woo. Glory. Come on. The glory's coming. Come on. The power's here. Come on, there's enough power in this room to open blind eyes, unstop deaf ears. Oh, yes. Come on now. Come on. He's going to do great things. Come on, he's going to do mighty things. And he's going to do it in you. All right. There go. I know it's late. They're going to sing. We got food waiting. I got a pastor friend, very successful, growing church, won souls by the hundreds. Young man walks up to him and says, Pastor, I want you to lay hands on me and give me your anointing. I love it. He laid his hand on him. He said, God, I pray you help him go bankrupt twice. He started listing all kind of tragedy and adversity. And that person said, stop. Stop the pastor. He said, no, 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 no. Uh -uh. I, I want you to pray for anointing. He said, that's exactly what I'm doing. Come on. <laughs> oh, come on. I believe God wants to put an anointing on us. But he don't want any flesh to glory in his presence. Come on, I feel the power in this place. Come on, I believe there's some young people that want everything God has for them. Come on. Wow, give God a shout. I'm going to do it. With his help, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be what he wants me to be.